Welcome back. Forbes magazine reports the average salary for NFL players in 2013 was about $2 million. According to the NFL Players Association, the average length of a player's career is three and a half years. Now combine the two and you have a lot of money in a short period of time. But does it last? Their football careers start on sod-covered fields all across the U.S. A talented few play through high school and college. Some even manage to make it to the NFL, a business where these often young, modern-day gladiators get paid millions to smash and grab. It's a brutal career, one that can result in broken bodies and empty bank accounts. Last spring, the National Bureau of Economic Research released a working paper that showed nearly 16 percent of NFL players file for bankruptcy 12 years after they retired. Poor money management and a lack of financial planning are often the cause. Steve Dills played quarterback at an elite university, then spent 10 years in the NFL. Through it all, he found time to learn a trade that would prepare him for life after the gridiron. He gives us a play-by-play -play of his career in today's Executive Profile. I had gone out in seventh grade, had said I want to be quarterback, and they said, you're a receiver. I said, okay, I'm a receiver, but then in PE, the varsity coach or ninth grade coach was my uh, PE coach. And so I kept grabbing rebounds and throwing the ball halfway down the court, hit guys in stride and touchdown. And afterwards he pulled me aside and said, you want to be a quarterback? I said, huh? He went in his uh, office, came out, handed me a book that I have today. It's about how being a quarterback and that's how I became a quarterback. When I was a uh, sophomore, I was planning on being the backup quarterback. We had a senior who had been a running back, but they decided to make him a quarterback. And uh, before the first, uh, game of the season, the starting running back got hurt. They moved him back to running back, made me a quarterback, and I started three years. And so, you know, all through my football career, I've had opportunities with, you know, things happening the right way for me and great coaches. Living on the West Coast, being the quarterback at Stanford had to be just prime picking. I was um, predisposed to go there because both my parents had gone there. I'd had grandparents, I'd had uncles, that kind of thing. But um, coming out of uh, a high school program that actually threw the ball, that's what I wanted to do. It made it an easy transition to go to Stanford. Dills Airborne swings it out to his fullback, Phil Francis. And then uh, 1978 happens. Who's Sammy Ball? Sammy Baugh is a uh, quarterback that uh, I believe he was SMU, and he, um, they've named a uh, trophy after him, which is actually given to the best college quarterback uh, for that year, and I was fortunate enough to win that award in 1978. And then the next year, you're drafted. Yep. Fourth round. Good for you. 97th pick. Yep. To Minnesota. Yep. The Kind of the funny story about it is Bill Walsh had been my college quarterback my last two years. Um, after our se uh, senior year, he gets uh, brought over to the 49ers, and I saw him a week before the draft, and Bill pulls me aside and said, do you have an agent yet? And I said, no. He said, don't get one. We're going to draft you. So this is a week before the draft. You know, I call my parents. I'm ecstatic. Couldn't be better. Um, you know, they don't, didn't have ESPN and all that stuff now, so you had to listen on AM radio, and when they got to the Niners pick, they go in the San Francisco 49ers pick in the third round, quarterback, Joe Montana, and it's like, what? No, it's one of those out-of-body experiences, and uh, so ended up, you know, they started calling me, say, well, they're going to take you with the Knicks pick. Well, by that time, the Minnesota Vikings picked me, and there you go from there. Well, you had ten great years in the yeah. NFL, and you had very good years. Three teams landed up mm -hmm. working for the Falcons yeah. at the, the final turn, but in the middle of that, and you had the strike. Yes. And you crossed over during the strike. The, the Players Association came by uh, the team and they said, you know, how many people are willing to strike over free agency? And we had one guy raise his hand at that time, and that was Eric Dickerson. And if I was Eric Dickerson, I'd have said the same thing. The biggest issue in any negotiation, you got to have leverage. Well, the union made the very poor decision, in my opinion, to go on strike after the third game of the season. And the reason that's a really bad idea is because players get paid only during the season, and you get paid every other week. So we had gone from the end of the last season all the way around to now we've only gotten one paycheck, and they expect everybody to walk out. And I knew we would not win. Most people were conflicted about it, and so I made, I was near the end of my career, and I didn't believe 
in the way the union was going about it and exactly what they were asking for. So uh, I made the decision to cross. And uh, it's amazing how many phone calls I got after I crossed saying, I wish I'd been with you. But a lot of people wouldn't do it. That was a brave move at the time. I remember it well. Yeah. So back in those days, you played football, but you also had second jobs. Correct. And you went into real estate, right? Right. Yeah out of it. Yeah. What, was, what was that all about? I didn't know how long I was going to play, so I needed to be doing something so that if, if it ended after one season, two season, whatever, I could do it. But the, really the way it happened is after my first year of uh, pro ball, I went back to Stanford and I looked up a bunch of alumni that did a lot of different things and said, you know, tell me what you do. And I, I went, because I was trying to figure out where I would want to work. And back then you did have an off season. I mean, they'd shake your hand, said, stay in shape, we'll see here at minicamp kind of thing. It wasn't the year round, the job that it is now. Um, and the two guys that really got my attention were developers, and they uh, were you know, very, very kind to spend time with me, explain to me what they do. And they also said, though, you can't go into development because the uh, you know, life cycle of a deal is too long, but you could get into brokerage. So um, come back after my second year, got a brokerage license, found a job with a local firm and started doing that. And then when I moved to Minnesota full time, I worked for them and it just kind of it, it, it worked for me in a lot of different ways. How, how did you end up staying in Atlanta? I know your, your last team was the Falcons mm -hmm. one year. I really was intrigued by the area. There were less than two million people at the time. It was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life because I hit it at the right time. Atlanta was taken off, you know, from a uh, growth standpoint. Um, you know, there's so many people that aren't from here that live here, so there's none of this who did you know and where did you go to school. It was if you can do something, they'll give you a chance, and it's a, it's a wonderful business community, a, a great real estate community. What did you take away from athletics, great coaches, that it's transferred into business that has made you the success really in two different industries. Playing in sports, kind of the, the common theme of the t people and the teams that were really successful came down to leadership. And I had, uh, you know, the great uh, fortune to play for Bill Walsh, who was the best I've ever been around, Bud Grant, great leader. I watched these people and why they're successful. And what I tried to do is adopt and, and kind of put into how I, um, View business, how I handle people, do all those things into, you know, transfer it from the football world into the business world. And um, over time, it's worked out really well. I try and choose good people, but some people, you know, come into your life. Our CEO of the company I work for now um, came into my life when I was at Grubb and Ellis, and I was able to f uh, follow, follow him over to Avis and Young, and he's just one of the great leaders I've ever met. And so I kind of hitch my wagon to those kind of people and uh, see, see where it leads me. Much like he did on the football field, Steve Dills continues to lead his team to victory. Avis and Young's Atlanta division represents a number of clients on a variety of commercial development projects and corporate relocations. He'll soon tackle another task. Dills is ramping up to become president of the Atlanta Commercial Board of Realtors next year. Next, since we spend most of our lives at work, shouldn't it be a place we enjoy? A look at the cities with best workplaces. Plus, NFL teams are billion dollar cash cows. We find out where the Falcons land on the list of the most valuable franchises. Stick around, Atlanta Business Chronicles Biz will return.